question. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite Adam Auer to turn on his webcam, and uh, I would like to introduce you. Adam has over 20 years experience as a sustainability professional working with public, private, and nonprofit institutions. As Vice President of Environment and Sustainability with the Cement Association of Canada, Adam works with government, industry, environmental, and other civil society groups to promote and enhance concrete's contribution to sustainability with a specific emphasis on life cycle approaches to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Prior to joining the CAC in 2012, Adam managed Environment Canada's Corporate Environmental Innovation, Innovation Initiative. A multi-stakeholder program to promote the business and financial case for corporate environmental leadership and the link between sustainability and an innovative and competitive economy. Adam holds a Master's of Environmental Studies from York University and a Bachelor of Science in Ecology from the University of British Columbia. Adam joins us today from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Please welcome Adam Auer. Thank you very much, Bill, for the kind introduction. Uh, just also want to confirm that you can see my screen. See and hear you very well. Thank you. I uh, also wanted to thank um, MLA Godfrey and Senator Cuff for the excellent introductory remarks and uh, to echo in particular MLA Godfrey's uh, um, support for the CCUS industry. Of course, we have two cement facilities in Alberta. Both are actively pursuing CCUS technologies. And in fact, one of the facilities in Alberta is um, vying for, we hope, the first carbon neutral cement planet or plant in uh, in the world so that's thanks in large measure to uh, some of the work that uh, the Alberta government has done to support that technology um, I'm going to try and pick up um, where my colleagues left off uh, providing a bit of a Canadian perspective but really building or uh, aiming to build on the conversation you know Andrew gave an excellent overview of the challenges we face as a society and thinking about what the built environment uh, needs to look like in a more sustainable and climate friendly future and you know how that drives the imperative for carbon neutral concrete. Rick showcased the incredible thinking and efforts that are already going into developing a technology roadmap to get to carbon neutral concrete and this tremendous work is, uh, being led by the PCA is being mirrored in Canada as we speak. I want to touch on this sort of collaboration message that I think you heard from both the previous speakers. What's the role of legislators, for example, in supporting our roadmap and accelerating its implementation? So I'm going to touch briefly on everything from carbon pricing, the codes and standards, but I'm really going to linger a, a bit on the issue of low carbon public procurement because I think this is an area where there's a growing appetite for collaboration and, are, and are really a tremendous opportunity to make an impact and to help bring some of the innovations that, that Rick talked about into the market. This is just a brief snapshot of where we are in Canada with our own roadmap development. This is a quite high, high level um, uh, snapshot. It's de been developed mostly as a communication tool uh, at this point, but you can see that it's already quite aligned with what uh, Rick presented, talking about everything from improved energy efficiency at the plants to lower carbon clinkers and cements, the use of low carbon fuels, mineralization and um, CCUS based technologies. Um, you know, the important takeaway I think for me is that there really is no silver bullet when it comes to getting to carbon neutral concrete. It's gonna take you know, a menu of technologies, if you will. And while different cement and concrete manufacturers may need to take slightly different routes to get there, we're all more or less ordering off the same menu. So collaboration is essential. Andrew mentioned Innovandi as one example of a very promising aspect of that collaboration on the technology side. But it's also very important that we work together with decision makers across the value chain as uh, Rick described, and also with legislators in the policy community. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to how that's working in Canada in just a moment. In Canada, we're also working on our own ambition statement aligned with the work that the GCCA and PCA are doing. I, you know, I put this up here, it's still uh, very much a draft document. It's not received any approvals of any kind, so um, please treat it as such. But you'll note that we also intend to set some shorter term carbon reduction targets because in Canada, at least, this is a really important part of the credibility um, dimensions of 
of our ambition to carbon neutral concrete and a real facilitator for the kinds of partnerships that we're looking for from the government of Canada. And in fact, that's that's directly that that's that's exactly what's sort of emerging in um, in in the federal family as well as at the provincial level uh, in Canada right now. In fact, because of the I think unique uh, challenges, but also unique opportunities we face uh, as a sector. Um, you know, our our government has been quite keen to partner with us as an example of how you can take a heavy, difficult to decarbonize industry, if you will, and showcase the opportunities to reduce carbon, but to do it in a way that actually supports jobs, economic growth, and this transition to uh, a clean economy. In fact, so just over a week ago, we formalized a new collaboration with our federal government on, in fact, developing uh, uh, some of the details of our uh, carbon transition roadmap, uh, supporting our ambition of carbon neutral concrete, and also creating, um, well, mostly focused on creating the enabling policy and R&D conditions for success. So in terms of policy levers, you know, the most, I think the foundational thing to understand about the cement sector is that it is what we call an emission intensive trade exposed sectors. In fact, it's one of the most emissions intensive uh, and trade exposed sectors in Canada and globally. And what does this really mean? It means that we're, we're vulnerable to um, uh, the potential cost impacts of climate policy if, they're, if those policies are not well designed. The, the graph on the, on the left of your screen here looks, uh, for example, at the ability of the cement sector in Canada to compete in the North American market if uh, there's a unilateral cost on carbon applied in the Canadian market only. And you can see that there's, uh, you know, of all the sectors in Canada, we are the most, uh, most vulnerable to negative competitive impacts from uh, policies that don't take into account these competitiveness uh, issues. And in fact, we did see this in the Penoir region in British Columbia in particular when uh, they were among the first introduced carbon pricing uh, without any particular measures to protect uh, EITE or emissions intensive trade exposed sectors. And we did see a corresponding loss of market share for, our, for domestic producers to imports from markets that didn't share the same uh, emissions constraints. And effectively, you know, we call this carbon leakage. It means that you've sort of lost the economic value of that sector uh, in the jurisdiction that is um, uh, adopting climate policies and you haven't really reduced GHGs, they've just shifted along with the jobs and economic activity to, to other sectors. So this has been sort of a foundational uh, aspect of our collaboration with government. How do we design climate policies, whether it's carbon pricing or otherwise, that are sensitive to these competitiveness uh, concerns? And we've had quite a bit of success, actually, including in British Columbia, uh, around designing uh, policies that do create those uh, market drivers for innovation. You know, carbon pricing has been a part of that. It has been material to investment decisions uh, in jurisdictions across Canada. It's helped set that long-term policy signal, which is important to uh, creating the certainty that is um, uh, more attractive to foreign capital, for example. Uh, but it's also been um, supported or, or complemented by other policies, in particular um, what I would call an emerging heavy industry sort of decarbonization transition strategy that is uh, underwritten by a number of uh, supports, um, in federal funding supports through, for example, a uh, recently announced $8 billion net zero accelerator fund, but also provincial supports um, in, including supports in British Columbia and Alberta, focused on CCUS and other technologies uh, relevant to uh, the decarbonization roadmap for our sector. The third big piece is this government procurement piece, which I'm going to spend uh, a bit more time on in just a minute. And it's really about making sure that as policymakers are pressuring the manufacturing sectors like cement manufacturing to reduce their carbon footprint, that they are also pulling the innovations that result from those policies into the market by using their purchasing power to reward leadership, to de-risk innovations, particularly in the construction sector where uh, there's a, 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 a fair bit of hesitancy or conservatism to, uh, to, to try new things just because of the 
critical nature of many of the things that we're involved in building, tall buildings, you know, bridges and other critical uh, infrastructure. The, the flip side of collaboration is, of course, trying to, um, you know, raise the red flags where things aren't working or where there are concerns. And, you know, I'm not going to go through these in any uh, given detail, but, uh, you know, un underpinning, I think, most of the concerns that you find uh, the cement industry and others would have around climate policy is just the, the its vulnerability to change. In Canada in particular, we've seen uh, uh, huge swings back and forth on a variety of different climate policies generally related to um, incoming governments that um, uh, uh, take you know different approaches to to the challenge. I think some of that is starting to settle. But it does, uh, and it's just sort of an important thing to uh, acknowledge as as policymakers that you know you attract the kind of investment that it's going to take to get to carbon neutral concrete. You know, we we have to be keep in mind that that business certainty, investment certainty, and policy stability is is hugely valuable uh, to to that effort. And I'm I, again, I won't get into the details of how this works with carbon pricing or any other specific policy, but I'd be happy to answer questions if it's of an interest. I would like to turn now briefly to the procurement uh, piece because it, it really is a critical part of the role that governments in particular can play in driving innovation and, and, and supporting the efforts of the industry to uh, develop low carbon solutions, whether that's lower carbon cement and concrete or uh, low carbon construction and design opportunities in the built environment. I'm going to use uh, Portland limestone cement as a bit of a case study to frame sort of where we are right now when it comes to the green procurement conversation. So PLC, as uh, Rick mentioned, is uh, it's effectively a drop-in substitute for the cement that's most commonly used in the United States and Canada right now. It produces concrete with the same durability and performance. It's code approved across uh, across both jurisdictions. In Canada, this is uh, uh, if we switched completely to Portland limestone cement, we would reduce or avoid uh, over a megaton of emissions per year. Uh, you could probably multiply that by about 10 in the United States. So very significant reduction for a very simple switch, a technology that uh, most cement producers, all cement producers in Canada are able to, to do today. And I believe uh, it's similar in the United States. What is the what is the main challenge? The main challenge is actually government specifiers. Government specifiers are the most reticent to adopt this very simple uh, carbon reduction opportunity. And if I go to um, the next slide, a, a big part of it is the the framing of procurement policy really is right now about lowest cost. And, and it's you know not uh, completely un uh, uh, you know it's, it's an understandable approach in the sense that we're talking about taxpayer dollars here, so we want to make sure that we are we are being efficient. But there is I think a growing gap between cost and value, and and the carbon conversation is really calling that out. We are thankfully I think starting to see a shift in this thinking at the government level. On on the right, you can see that there there is. Um, this is a, a U.S. data, but it's very similar in, in Canada. Public procurement accounts for about a third of all construction material purchases uh, in, in North America. So the opportunity to make markets for uh, innovative products is, is quite huge. Canada, the Canadian government has kind of seized on this to uh, create a new greening of government strategy, which is now inclusive of not just things like fuels and energy use in their buildings, but looking at what we call embodied carbon. So the, the, the carbon that comes with the structural materials like cement and concrete and steel uh, and others, and integrating targets into their procurement practices. So disclosing, first of all, we, we will be required to disclose the amount of carbon associated with our products by 2022. Uh, they have established um, a target of reducing the amount of carbon embedded in building materials purchased by the federal government by 30% starting in 2025, and um, and then moving towards uh, what has been previously described as the sort of life cycle assessment approaches to 
um, to their assets, whether it's a building or, or bridges. So looking at the carbon impact of that infrastructure over its entire life. So the questions that this raises for us is, okay, well, if, if we're gonna disclose, you know, we mentioned EPDs, um, uh, are they the right tool? Do they give us the, the data that, they, that, that is needed to make these decisions? Are they cost effective? Uh, what is the baseline that's going to be used when we talk about carbon reductions? You know, concrete, as I'll get into in a minute, is a pretty diverse material. So what's the starting point against which you're going to measure these embodied carbon reductions? And then how are we going to design the procurement uh, criteria to allow for the most innovative and to incentivize the most innovative solutions? So how do we move from prescriptive approaches that limit innovation to more performance-based approaches that set carbon reductions as a, as a goal and then encourage the market to come up with the innovations to meet those, those goals. I'm gonna to touch on each of these challenges just, just briefly to give you a sense of the sort of state of the conversation that's happening in Canada and I believe it's also happening, uh, well, in many states um, across the US and also at the federal level. But, um, the first challenge is really around information. How do you how do you make sure that the data that you're using to make decisions is accurate? Right now, uh, you can use a variety of different tools to measure the embodied carbon impact of any given material, including concrete. But even if you look at uh, the exact same concrete mix design, for example, and you look at it through through different tools, you can get a significant difference in results. It's small enough that these give you a good sense of direction on how different technologies might reduce carbon, but it does pose a challenge if you're making a decision between one company versus another or one mix versus versus another. We need to get that accuracy up in order to enable that kind of the kind of confidence we need uh, in those types of decisions. You know, I mentioned before, concrete is you know extremely versatile. It's one of its most important attributes, but actually it makes it kind of challenging to decide, well, how do you reduce embodied carbon for a material that's not a, a monolithic material, but in fact takes many forms and is used in many different types of applications, uh, where its 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 functionality is defined not just by strength, but also how fast that strength is gained, its durability, stiffness, density, all sorts of various parameters that can actually uh, make it very difficult to pin down. You know what is the right baseline? What is the the right functional performance uh, against you know to use as a reference? against our low carbon targets. Again, another, another argument for avoiding prescriptive approaches to procurement and creating performance-based approaches that, that invite and encourage innovation from the market. The other element which um, you know, Rick uh, spoke about very well, of course, is working with the design and construction community. There's all sorts of what we call GHG touch points, and I won't go through them in, in, in detail, but there's a lot of decisions that are made at the design and construction phase that can really have an impact on the carbon, uh, and the embodied carbon in the materials that are that are being used. You know, for example, how quickly do you need that carbon to gain its or that concrete to gain its strength? That can have a huge impact on the amount of cement that's required, the amount of SCMs that can be used, and therefore the total carbon of that material. So part of the procurement process is not just choosing the lowest carbon material, but understanding how to use that material effectively in your project. Uh, and and finally I'll talk a little bit about material comparison. So Again, because there are so many different uh, um, variables that go into any given project, it's actually quite different, difficult to make trade-offs between materials. Is steel going to be the better solution on carbon than concrete, or wood is increasingly uh, making its way into certain uh, building archetypes where it hasn't been used before, and a lot of people are trying to make comparisons around the carbon intensity of those different um, materials. We're not there yet in terms of uh, the data and sort of level accounting methodologies that would allow us to make those comparisons. So it's another area that we're working on. And so finally, just to conclude very briefly, what are we doing to help um, address these challenges and promote a robust low carbon procurement agenda? First of all, we're uh, doubling down on disclosure. Uh, a lot of really exciting things happening with um, companies uh, going the distance in terms of creating 
uh, very high resolution disclosures around their carbon impact, right down to individual facilities and individual uh, products. Uh, this is happening in both Canada and the US, and it's a huge step forward to being able to kind of create more certainty around decision making on carbon. Uh, we've developed new tools. The GDA deserves tremendous credit for the development of a new EPD tool, which is going to address some of the cost uh, barriers to developing uh, climate disclosures in our industry but also uh, improve the comparability by creating a common platform and a common data set that decision makers in government and elsewhere can use to have greater assurance that the decisions they're making are, are, are valid and actually are driving uh, carbon reductions. And finally, I'll, I'll just mention a recent uh, standard that was developed by the um, a Canadian Standards Association in collaboration with a number of Canadian and US entities. Again, another effort to make uh, climate uh, disclosures, carbon information about our product more accessible, more easily available to drive uh, low carbon decision making in both uh, public procurement and in the private sector. I'm, I'm cognizant I'm a bit over time, so I'm going to I'm going to leave it there, and I look forward to um, to uh, any questions and the and the discussion that's going to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. And I want to thank our other speakers, Andrew and Rick, and I invite you to uh, turn on your webcams. We do have one question. I realize we're kind of getting up against a hard stop, but I think this is a question worthy of, of discussing just briefly. Uh, Adam, you, you, you touched on it, but here is a question. What is your vision of the adoption or acceptance of blended cement technology, such as type 1L, type 1P, type 1T, uh, uh, as an opportunity to make a relatively quick impact on CO2 reduction. And what will that require from government agencies uh, for adoption? I mean, that, that question is right on the mark. That is exactly the, the sort of discussion and negotiation that we're having in particular with our federal government right now, but also at uh, subnational governments across the country. And the tricky thing is, is that specifiers are, 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 they oppose being told what to specify. So if you, you know, we've tried government mandates uh, to mandate the use of Portland limestone cement or blended Portland limestone cements, for example, as a no-brainer, uh, adoptable immediately opportunity to reduce GHG emissions by 10%. And, and we have encountered all sorts of political support, all sorts of policy support from the procurement policy community, and absolute 100% uh, resistance at the specifier level. And so, you know, they're engineers and they have legal liability around the designs that they sign off and maybe that makes them uh, extra conservative. We, we do scratch our heads sometimes because of course there are plenty of examples around the world of these materials being used in all manner of critical infrastructure, whether it's, you know, 100 story buildings or suboceanic tunnels or, or uh, hydroelectric you know, dams, like th this is a, ma a proven material, but there is this reticence to adopt that kind of a, uh, of a mandate. And so we are now trying to figure out, well, what is the best language, policy language, that would allow um, these low carbon innovations to be pulled into the market without telling engineers how to do their job? And, and you know, Andrew and Rick and, and many of us have been part of these conversations. What you know, how do you migrate the industry towards a more performance-oriented uh, target on on low carbon? And so that's that's what we're fixated on right now. How do we create language that uh, requires government specifiers uh, and and hopefully ultimately private sector specifiers will adopt it as well to to demand the lowest carbon solution for the projects that they're working on. And of course it's complicated because you know we mentioned all of the variabilities that go into any given project. There's different strength requirements, there's different constructability requirements, even the weather can make a really big difference in terms of what you're able to do in terms of decarbonization. So it, re it really, it can't be sort of a blanket solution. It has to recognize all of this variability. But the starting point is to recognize that low carbon should be should absolutely be among the criteria that specify or you know, that procurers of concrete consider when they're putting out tenders on their projects. Outstanding. I'd like to um, thank you for your presentations and, and also for your comments uh, regarding the question.